an older gentleman in his 50s walked through the lobby with a younger hippie looking guy and he said look at this place looks like crap we need somebody to clean this up and i jumped out of my chair dropped my billboard on the floor which was like a mexican floor tile floor it made a thwack he turned around looked at me and i waved my arm said i'll do it and he just looked at me like who is this guy why is he in my lobby and he was silent. He just gave me this weird stare. And I said, I'll do it. I'll clean your studio. Who are you? Are you here with Stills, who was there recording Love you, Love the One You're With? Um, the Bee Gees were there recording Jive Talking. Clapton was there doing I Shot the Sheriff and the whole 461 Ocean Boulevard album. And the Eagles were there doing the One of These Nights record. And he said, you know, are you here with Stills? Are you here with that? No, I'm not with any of them. I'm here with the delivery guy from Ace Music who then wanted to kill me. Uh, he grabbed me by my shirt, the owner of the studio, whose name was Mac Emmerman, and I ho owe him everything. Uh, he grabbed me by my shirt, <laughs> literally could have dragged me over to the front door, opened the door and said, and stay out. <laughs> and I waited for him to disappear because it was a glass door. I could see him going down the hallway. I opened the door. I said to the receptionist, is that the owner? Yes, it is. What's his name? Mac Emmerman. I called him 25 times that week, five times a day, for five days straight, finally, Friday after 4 p.m., he got on the phone. He said, look, kid, you're driving my reception. It's crazy. If, you, uh, if I interview you for this job, which is an internship, and you don't get it, you promise you'll never call here again <laughs> as long as you live. And I said, okay. So I drove about an hour back up there. I walked into his, his office. Before he had a chance to even stand up from his desk, I just leaned across the desk shook his hand and said, I will be the first one in and the last one out every day. And he said, okay, you've got the job. It may last a day. It may last a week. It may last a lifetime. It's up to you. That is awesome. Yeah. I, I owe him everything. How long were you at Criteria? Um, just under two years. It was like 21 months or something like that. Okay, so then what happened? Did you graduate to being an assistant? I did. Um, I started out, uh, as we all did, wrapping cables and labeling tape boxes and, and pizza runs and whatever else I was asked to do. And then uh, one day I got a call from the front office that an unknown band called Firefall uh, was going to do an album in Studio A and none of the other assistants wanted to work on the record because they weren't famous yet. Uh. <laughs> Everybody had gotten really spoiled there working only with famous people all the time. Well, Firefall was a, a band that had a lot of guys, you know, from the band Spirit and yeah. um, several other bands in, in there. Um, and so they threw me in and uh, luckily the engineer, uh, the first engineer on the record was a guy named Carl Richardson who uh, was also a co-producer on the BG stuff. Yep. Um, and I had been taking Carl's RIAA class at night on recording techniques with a book written by Robert Runstein. I still remember the author's name. Still going strong. Really? All these years, yeah. Wow. And uh, Carl said to me, you go set up the room. And I remember immediately thinking, oh my God, I'm sweating so bad you could see it in my armpits because I was scared to death. I mean, here was this guy, Carl, that I idolized. And he said, you go set up the room. You, you know, talk to the players, find where they want to be in the room and you pick the mics and you set it up. Scared to death. Anyway, after it was all done, I came back in the control room and he said, I wouldn't change a thing. I almost cried. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So that was the first record that I got to work on as an assistant. Um, then I, I got to work on some Clapton sessions as an assistant. Um, uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young did a reunion record that never came out, but it ended up being Stills, Young, Long May You Run. And on that record, uh, that was my bar mitzvah. Don Gaiman was the first engineer on it. We were in the building 37 days straight without leaving. And at some point, Don said something like, uh, you know, can you run this thing? And he pointed to the console. And I remember I got to overdub background vocals. And uh, I remember pinching myself. It was the only time in my career I ever pinched myself on the leg and kind of whispered to myself, do you realize where you are yeah, and what yeah. you're doing? And I remember saying, uh, Neil, back out like 18 inches. David, come in a little bit. And then I told all the guys drop a quarter by their right toe, you know, so they could find their spot again afterwards. And I, I, I almost had a stroke, <laughs> you know, I, I was probably 20, 21 years old or something like that. And, uh, so that was, was my career. Then I, I left criteria. Somebody built a, uh, a criteria equivalent studio in Fort Lauderdale. And there were really only two real studios in South Florida at the time. 
It's called Triad Recording. And I went there as an independent pr to bring a record that I was engineering and producing. And the owner of the studio said, look, I don't know how to run this console. I don't know how to you clearly know how to do both. Why don't you just take the place over and make sure that you don't lose my grandfather's investment? And the guy just left. So I kind of inherited a world-class 24-track studio around 1977, I think. Um, some, and, yeah, uh, you know, I graduated to engineer and then producer while I was there. It's a mind-blowing experience when you work with people that you idolize and you realize they're just humans too. Uh, but you have to carry yourself in such a way that they trust you and feel confident that you're not going to screw up what they're doing. How did you get to LA? Very circuitous path. Um, I was in South Florida for 10 years and then at some point realized that I was not seeing I had, my first daughter, Rachel, was born in I don't think I held the kid more than three times in uh, the first six months of her life. And, and so at some point uh, I decided I wasn't going to do records anymore and uh, that I'd had a, the Mariel boat lift had happened in South Florida and crime just went through the roof. The whole cocaine cowboy thing was, was terrible. Uh, 